You're listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with a registered patent attorney, Dr. Adam Diamond, founder of Diamond Patent Law, the number one source for securing your intellectual property needs. Now, here's your host, Adam Diamond. Hello and welcome to the Patenting for Inventors podcast, episode 47, How to Respond to Obviousness Rejections. My name is Dr. Adam Diamond, a registered patent attorney and founder and owner of Diamond Patent Law in Los Angeles, California. I can be contacted through my website at diamondpatentlaw.com, that's D-I-A-M-E-N-T, patentlaw.com, or if that's too hard to remember, you can get to it by going to patentingforinventors.com, that's patentingforinventors.com, or you can call me at 424 421-0162. And while most attorneys can only practice in states where they're members of that state's bar, patent attorneys are actually allowed to practice patent law in any state, so feel free to contact me regardless of where you live. I've actually been kind of dreading doing this episode for a long time, and it's not because responding to obviousness rejections uh, is probably the bread and butter of most patent attorneys that deal with patent applications, and it's also not that I'm trying to hide the ball on how to respond. Is that when you get a rejection based on obviousness is really fact and invention specific. Now, how you write a response when you get a rejection because the examiner says that your new mechanical pencil is obvious over other existing mechanical pencils is going to be very different from how you write a response if an examiner says that your new cancer drug treatment is obvious over other cancer drug treatments. That's not to say that the laws of obviousness aren't the same for both, but when you start arguing about why it's not obvious, you really have to go into the facts of each type of invention. I could probably do 50 or more episodes on just responding to different kinds of obviousness rejections. So that's why I've been dreading this episode, because I'm not really sure which aspects to cover. And what I'll likely do is give a very broad, but not very deep overview of rejections based on obviousness. And then later on in the podcast series, I'll probably go back into more depth in some of the more common areas of obviousness that pop up a lot. So what is an obviousness rejection? If you remember one of the earliest podcast episodes, I said that in order to get a patent, your invention has to be new, useful, and non-obvious. The useful standard is pretty easy. It's really a low bar to pass. Almost everything has some use. Then it has to be new. Uh, This is what I talked about last episode, the novelty standard, or section 102. If something is exactly the same as your claimed invention, then it lacks novelty because it's anticipated by prior art. So now we're left with non-obvious. Section 35 USC 103 is the law regarding this, and it basically says that even if there's not a single prior art reference that's exactly the same as your invention, if the difference between your invention and the prior art are obvious to what is called a person having ordinary skill in the art, then you can't get a patent on it. We can go into lots of cases about what a person having ordinary skill in the art is, and what obviousness means, and the standard actually hasn't been the same, it changes every so often, but the main case used uh, currently is called Graham versus John Deere, and there's a three-step process. First is to determine the scope and content of the prior art. Second, you look at the differences between the claims invention and the prior art. And third, you look at the level of ordinary skill in the art. Now, I'm really going to oversimplify things here, but for the first step, the scope and content of the pertinent art, what essentially the examiner is going to do is find things that are most similar. If your invention is about mechanical pencils, the examiner is going to look for mechanical pencils that already exist, and maybe we'll also look for some other writing implements like pens. Let's go to the example of you claiming a mechanical pencil that has a long cylindrical body, a button on the top to make pencil lead come out, an eraser, and a hole at the tip for lead to come out. Now, even though this already exists, let's just just pretend it doesn't. Let's say that the only mechanical pencils that exist don't have a button on the top, but only have a button on the side. The examiner can't reject based on novelty because your claimed invention doesn't exist. But let's say the examiner finds a pen that has a clickable button on the top, not on the side. So you put all those together, and what's already out there in one patent is that there's a mechanical pencil with a long cylindrical body, an eraser, and a hole that's it for lead, and a second patent that shows a pen that has a button on top uh, to make the tip of the pen come out. So the scope and content of the prior art are these mechanical writing instruments. The next step is that you look at the differences between the pertinent prior art and the invention at issue. The difference here is that your invention has a button on the top, but the prior art is a pencil with a button on the side. The prior art also shows a pen that has a long cylindrical body, no eraser, but it does have a button on top. Next, we're going to look at the ordinary level of skill in the pertinent art. There are all kinds of factors and tests to determine who is this person having ordinary skill in the art. 
In this example, the person having ordinary skill in the art might be a mechanical engineer in the field of writing instruments with a few years' experience. So the question is, from the perspective of this hypothetical person, would it be obvious to have a clickable button on top like the pen has, given that, until now, the clickable button on the pencils have always been on the side? Now, I'm not saying yes or no at this time, but this is how the analysis is going to be done in the rejection. The examiner might say that it would be obvious to a person uh, having ordinary skill in the art to just modify the positioning of the button on the pencil to put it on top, and it's obvious because buttons are positioned on the top for pens. Now, we can argue that how the button works on the pencil is very different than what the button does on the pen, and you're probably right. The button on the pen just projects and retracts the tip of the, of the pen, but the pencil doesn't uh, retract the lead. It just keeps pushing it out. Those are all good things to keep in mind because you might have to amend the claims to distinguish the buttons. But the point is, the examiner is going to look at similar things. Each thing doesn't have everything that your invention has, but put all those things together and it does have everything. So the question is, the prior art shows all of your limitations, but would, have, would it have been obvious to put them all together to form your invention? Now, the rule for obviousness used to be much more black and white, and there was a bright line rule. The examiner would have to find something out there that either taught, suggested, or motivated someone to move the position of the button on the pencil. This is called the TSM test for teaching, suggestion, and motivation. If the examiner couldn't find an explicit teaching, suggestion, or motivation to modify the existing pencil, then you should be able to get a patent. But the Supreme Court in 2007 said that the TSM test isn't the only test that can be used, and now there's no bright line rule. It's just those factors in the Graham v. Deere case. So one of the most difficult things about obviousness rejections now is that no matter how objective the rule makes it seem, in the real world, sometimes it's just tough to argue to someone that what they think is obvious isn't obvious, but only seems obvious in hindsight. Now, there are lots of ways to try to objectively argue that your combination of elements is not obvious. There are probably at least 20 different ways or more to argue non-obviousness, and many of these are called secondary considerations of non-obviousness, and not everyone will apply in every single case, but in the next episode or episodes, I'm going to touch on some of the main arguments you can make to argue against your invention being considered obviousness. As I said, this was a really basic overview of obviousness, and I glossed over a lot of the fine details, but the gist of it is, if your invention doesn't exist in one prior art reference all by itself, but all the parts of your invention exist in different references, would it be obvious to a person having ordinary skill in the art to combine those parts to make your invention? If the answer is yes, then you're not going to get a patent. If the answer is no, then you should be able to get a patent. And I'm going to go through some of these main arguments uh, to try to convince the examiner that the answer should be no. Now, if you want help with drafting your patent application, you can contact me through my website at patentingforinventors.com. That's patentingforinventors.com. Or call Diamond Patent Law at 424 424- 281-0162. I'm Adam Diamond, and until next time, keep on inventing. Thanks for listening to the Patenting for Inventors podcast with host Adam Diamond. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review on iTunes. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only. The facts of every legal matter are unique, and the content of this podcast should not be construed as offering legal advice for your specific legal situation. For more information and help with your own intellectual property needs, contact Adam Diamond at patentingforinventors.com. That's patentingforinventors.com or call Diamond Patent Law at 424-281-0162. The preceding information may be considered an attorney advertisement and does not establish any attorney-client relationship.